My name is Jerry Williams. I am the founder and president of Myositis Support and Understanding. Today is Rare Disease Day 2018, and as part of our Rare Disease Day awareness, we are honored to have Dr. Victoria Worth join us for an overview and new developments in dermatomyositis. If you, like many of us myositis patients do, research, you are likely to have already read something Dr. Worth has published as she has authored over 200 papers. Dr. Worth is an internist and dermatologist, and her practice is devoted to autoimmune skin diseases. However, before we get started, I want to extend a special thank you to Corvus Pharmaceuticals for partnering with us today on Rare Disease Day. Corvus Pharmaceuticals is a phase three clinical stage company focused on the development and commercialization of novel therapies to treat rare, chronic, serious inflammatory, and fibrotic diseases. The company's next study, testing their lead investigational therapy in dermatomyositis, is currently in the planning stages of development. So Dr. Worth is one of the myositis experts. She is a professor of dermatology and medicine at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and the chief of dermatology at the Philadelphia VAMC. So with that, Welcome, Dr. Worth. So I'm going to talk today about uh, really dermatomyositis overall, uh, and also talk, you know, with a little bit of a focus on skin, since I am a dermatologist but also an internist. So what I would like to start out with, and I'm not going to make this a technical talk necessarily, but to help understand the context for how we treat people and also how we're improving treatments, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are inflammatory cells in the skin. There seem to be pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, that can drive the inflammation, that there seem to be some medications that can actually trigger or exacerbate dermatomyositis. We're learning much more about antibodies. So we'll talk a little bit about that first, and then we're going to talk about, uh, so by way of background, I would say, about dermatomyositis, and then also how do we, what, is, what do people look like clinically, which I think you guys are the experts on, but, you know, what is amyopathic versus classical dermato? lung disease, quality of life in dermato, and evaluation and treatment. So first to say, there we know, are beginning to learn more and more that there's an interferon signature in the skin, the blood, and the muscle. And what that means, interferon is a protein that's made by, in particular, by some of the uh, inflammatory cells. Uh, one of them is called the plasmacytoid dendritic cell that can be found in the blood, in the muscle, and in the skin. And it can drive a lot of the inflammation that we see. And we actually happen to know now pretty specifically that interferon beta and interferon gamma, again, two proteins, can drive a lot of this inflammation. And so we're learning more about how to, how to modify that as time goes on. There's increased interferon, this DM means dermato, in the, in, the, in the skin and also in the blood relative to other, for instance, skin diseases or, and lupus you can see also has an interferon signature. Uh, so these are things that make us think we understand a little bit more about the pathogenesis uh, and some of the inflammation that's being driven. And this is just to show you that the score seems to correlate best in terms of the interferon with interferon beta, interferon gamma, because there's a linear correlation between an interferon score and the transcript, in other words, uh, the messenger in uh, RNA that we see in the blood uh, for these very specific proteins. And then this is about as technical as I'm going to get. I promise it's going to get better. So uh, in any event, we recognize the fact that um, there are, uh, off, there's often inflammation overlying the, the joints on the uh, hand. It can be on the elbows, the knees. And this is cosmetically a huge issue and often very itchy and very problematic. Also on the upper back can be very, as you can see, very red and very inflamed and very difficult to live with and deal with. Um, and sometimes we can see, this is called Gotrin sign. These are the papules here that I'm pointing out to you uh, over the, uh, the, the fingers. And um, th this is something that we look for in order to make a diagnosis of dermatomyositis, but not everybody has this, but many people do. Um, and then on the next slide, we also are using antibodies to basically try to understand more about the disease and also what, what are the different presentations of the disease. And we're still in pretty early days with these, but, and we're not very good at measuring them in the commercial uh, antibodies. But as we get better at it, we think that they're going to be helpful in predicting complications potentially a little bit, and maybe a little bit about prognosis, and also about how to think about therapy. But I think it's early days still, and we don't quite know everything we need to know. 
So if you're interested in myositis, you probably know that there's really quite a lot of antibodies. I've listed a few of these here on the left on the slide, and they each seem to have a slightly different significance. But some of them, although there's an association, for instance, TIF1 gamma, most of the time, for instance, we don't see an association with underlying processes. And, uh, and, and so these antibodies are really only a loose correlate, and they're not meant, I call them a little bit like, a, you know, right now still very investigational. And then we have some antibodies that we see in people who might be more likely to have lung problems. And when that happens, we kind of have a different approach in terms of evaluation and treatment. Um, but you can see, again, this list is pretty long, and they're even, these are called, you know, more or less myositis-associated myositis antibodies. And even beyond all these, there are some, uh, or rather myositis-specific antibodies, there are also myositis-associated antibodies. So, you know, these are telling us something about the disease, but we don't exactly know what yet. Um, and then with the antisynthetase syndrome, again, it's one of those antibodies that I showed you on the last slide. And then usually it can be associated with interstitial lung disease or myositis or inflammatory arthritis. And we, we do see a lot of people who have arthritis in association with their dermatomyositis. So this is a very specific um, syndrome that we're still working to define also. Uh, some people might have fever. They might have uh, their hands turning colors in the cold called Raynaud's. And they might have some roughness on the sides of their fingers or on the, on the palms of the hands, and that's called mechanics hands. So uh, anti-MDA5, probably you've heard of this antibody, can be associated with, sometimes with ulcerations in the skin. And you can see here that when people have studied uh, what, what are the, what's the significance of MDA5, relative to other people with dermato, they might say, okay, there's more lung disease, there's more skin ulcers, there's more palmar papules, more of that roughness I was talking about on the fingers, uh, oral lesions, and hair loss. So this is the kind of um, what we call phenotyping relative to having a specific antibody that we're doing, but for any given antibody, it's a relatively small percentage of people who have that antibody and typically only one antibody. So this is what we call mechanics hands, where you get this roughness and scaling and erosions and crusting on the sides of the fingers and on the tip of the fingers, sometimes going onto the palm, like you can see here. Um, so that's mechanics hands, and you can see it again here. Sometimes you see papules, uh, often uh, in the area of the, uh, where the joints are, uh, and that can also be something that we see. Sometimes we see ulcers. That can be seen, for instance, with this antibody against M the uh, MDA5. And so, you know, again, these can all look a little bit different. Again, more ulcers, you can see some inflamed joints. And so this is the kind of thing that you can see uh, in dermatomyositis and in specifically often in association with MDA5. So we do see interstitial lung disease in people who have either hypomyopathic or amyopathic, and what that means is people who don't have a lot of muscle, but they might, the hypomyopathic means a little bit of muscle um, abnormalities, maybe in the blood or on testing, but no weakness, no pain, nothing. And then amyopathic is really nothing at all, not even in the blood test. And so we don't exactly know how many people have one of these two uh, findings. I would say in a dermatology-focused dermatomyositis practice, it might be over 50%. In the general population, it's probably less, and I'll show you some data for that. And then classic dermatomyositis is where there's muscle and sometimes often skin um, and or lung. And this table is actually showing you that even in the patients who have no muscle disease, that there's a pretty good incidence of interstitial lung disease that we find. And so we usually will screen for that in people, you know, at baseline and then over time to make sure that, there's, uh, that there is not lung disease because that can modify the approach to treatment. So recently we did some studies looking back at what antibodies are present in the blood of people who have dermatomyositis or might are thought to maybe have it. And these are the blood, the antibody tests that I was just showing you before that are thought to have prognostic potentially significance. However, what you can see right now with the commercial labs is that they're pretty low. Like people who have definite dermatomyositis, you know, only about 20% of them have any antibody at all in terms of a myositis-specific antibody. And in those who have skin 
predominant disease, it's maybe more like 10%. So these are people with, you know, known skin dermato, known dermatomyositis with muscle and skin. So these antibodies are, are, are useful, but very often they're negative. And so having a negative antibody doesn't mean you don't have dermatomyositis. It just means you don't have the antibody. And that and also means that we probably need to get better at how to detect it uh, because we may be missing some of them. So then to go on and talk a little bit about mechanics hands, which I showed you a picture of it, we have some definitions and it can be again on the arm, hands or on the palms and it can be pretty uncomfortable. And this is some examples. This is actually Gotrin's on the top of the thumb, but then on the sides of the fingers, you can appreciate that there's scale and some papules there. And then here again, there's some scaling. And so again, we, we think of this as largely mechanics hands. So it turns out in dermatomyositis, I would say most of the time we don't know why people get it, but very frequently it's in families where there's some autoimmune disease or in people who have other autoimmune diseases. Um, in other people, there can be triggers such as certain medications. Um, one, is, one of them is hydroxyurea, another is penicillamine, which is not used so much anymore. Occasionally the statins. So there are cases where people have drugs that seem to sort of either exacerbate or, or uh, actually uh, are present in, in initiation of dermatomyositis, but again, a very small percentage of people who get these drugs. I would say that if you have dermatomyositis, you probably do not want to go on a blocker of TNF. And the reason for that, and I'll show you in a minute, is that we've seen some people who actually get new onset disease when they get a TNF blocker for their arthritis. They have an inflammatory arthritis, which is thought to be maybe what we call seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. There's nothing in the blood to say you have rheumatoid arthritis, but you might have inflammation in the, in the hand or in the joints. And then um, when given a TNF blocker, it seems to kind of uh, cause um, some kinds of flare or an exacerbation. And it's often hard to know what the cause of an inflammatory arthritis is. So it's not a, a problem necessarily getting the medication for the arthritis, but if you know you have dermato, you probably do not want to take a TNF blocker. And the idea is that potentially when you block TNF, you get more interferon and that drives more inflammation. And so that's sort of thought to be the rationale behind why the TNF blockers are not so good. So going on to the skin findings of dermatomyositis, we know that there are um, papules over the joints. Uh, Gotrin's papules are where you have the papules that we showed you before, and then sign is just the erythema. And again, on the elbows, knees, and over the, on the, over the joints and the hands. And then in addition, um, other characteristic findings might be a heliotrope, which is usually pink or red or scale around the up, uh, on the eyelids, uh, around the eyes. You can see sometimes uh, telangiectasia, so dilated blood vessels uh, in the on the nails and periungal area, right behind the um, the the uh, nail plate or the I guess fingernail. And then there are dystrophic cuticles, where the cuticles just look a little bit ragged and are often painful, and that's a big problem. And then you can also see um, red on the arm or uh, in photo distributed areas on the face, on the scalp. And so that also hints at the fact that the sun can be a bit of a trigger or exacerbator for some patients. In addition to what I just was talking about, we can sometimes see blisters uh, in, in the skin as a result of some of the changes that, that are uh, of the inflammation. Also, we can see erosions and ulcerations. Uh, sometimes we get plugging of vessels that can lead to ulcers. Uh, you can see sometimes hyperpigmentation and hypopigmentation, as well as dilated blood vessels and atrophy in the skin. And we kind of lump that together and call that as poikiloderma. And that's a very, very common thing that we see, especially as the redness goes away, we can be left with poikiloderma. And then sometimes we see calcium in the skin, which is another large problem for people. So we saw this picture, but this is other characteristic areas in the V of the neck, uh, which can be seen in dermatomyositis. This is Gotrin's on the elbows. Uh, this is what we call the Shaw sign. So you can get redness on the upper back, and you can also see on the extensor arm here, going up into the neck and the scalp. And this kind of finding, especially in the scalp, causes so much itching that people have trouble sleeping. They really, it's very uh, problematic for people. Um, and then again, the ragged cuticles, and you can see here dilated blood vessels as well as dropout of vessels. So these are, again, hallmarks that we look for in making a diagnosis of dermatomyositis. Here's the dilated blood vessels that you can see here without any magnification. 
again, something we really look for. So one of the things that we do is we sometimes will look for different, again, uh, skin findings with different antibodies. And you can see there's been a lot of work done to try to describe the kinds of skin findings that are seen in a specific antibody. And I don't think it's so important to go through this right now, but just to say that there is some literature that has tried to do this with just about every antibody. We saw that already. This is a libido. And this libido is a secondary change that we see in people who have dermato sometimes, and it's really related to more sludging of, of the blood flow. And if you were to, for instance, biopsy the skin, which we often do to make, help make a diagnosis um, in people who have, have skin findings of dermatomyositis, in this particular situation, it's not going to show the changes of dermatomyositis because these are more secondary changes due to the slow flow, uh, flow of blood. We've seen the ulcers, and MDA5 is thought to plug up the vessels and then lead to ulcers, and that's what we call vasculopathic. We have classifications for dermato, and, you know, these are very useful. Some of the, uh, and I'll go through these, adult polymyositis would be muscle involvement, no skin. Adult dermato is usually muscle and skin. Uh, then it can be associated with an underlying malignancy. Uh, sometimes, I will tell you, most, most of the time not. Uh, and then childhood dermato is another uh, variation. And then there are people who have overlaps between dermato and other things like lupus or scleroderma. Uh, the skin predominant we talked about, where you have all the skin findings of dermatomyositis and none of the muscle findings. But these people also get lung disease sometimes. And then inclusion body myositis, which is really a little bit of a separate entity that I'm not going to really be talking too much about today. So one of the things I have found is that dermatomyositis um, takes a long time to get diagnosed. And you can ask why, and particularly for people who have the skin findings without muscle, it's very hard to get the diagnosis. And it's taken me a while to figure out why. But it turns out that these criteria, which were published in the New England Journal in 1976 or 1975, really only work if you have muscle disease and muscle weakness. Um, or muscle findings. And so um, this, these criteria were developed for the, with um, the muscle patients in mind, but not the skin patients. And so there are many people who have skin disease who don't fit these criteria. And so over time, they've been called other, other diseases, uh, such as undifferentiated connective tissue disease, or systemic lupus, or something else. So when we're thinking that somebody has dermatomyositis and we see skin problems, we might consider doing a skin biopsy, which if, may be helpful in confirming the diagnosis. Uh, if the person has an elevated muscle enzymes and muscle weakness or um, pain, then you, we will often use an EMG or MRI to look for muscle problems. Uh, muscle biopsy can be helpful, but I have to say I think it's being done less and less because we have other ways of imaging and then also getting the skin biopsy. And so we do muscle biopsies when, when we're having a hard time establishing the diagnosis. But if, um, if you have muscle disease but also skin that looks like dermato, you may not need a biopsy. And then myositis autoantibodies we've already talked quite a bit about. So again, to reiterate, the amyopathic dermato is typical skin changes of dermato but no muscle weakness for about two years or longer no other abnormalities that can be found uh, when you just study the muscles, if you were to study the muscles. And you may not need to if it's just skin. So we already alluded to this, but often people are misdiagnosed with systemic lupus, and the reason is because the criteria for lupus and dermatomyositis in the skin really do overlap. You can get a, a malar rash, photosensitivity, and ANA and oral ulcers, in dermatomyositis, and those are the same criteria that, we, that are, would allow one to say you have systemic lupus. So then what you have to do is say, okay, we have these criteria, but then we have to really look carefully, for instance, at the skin to figure out what, what is the disease itself. And if you have the changes that I showed you before of dermatomyositis, then you're going to say it's dermato, and if it doesn't look like dermatomyositis, then it might be something else. So the other point is that the skin biopsy is identical between lupus and dermatomyositis. So a biopsy helps put you into a connective tissue category, but then again, you have to look at the skin itself to make a definitive diagnosis. I also mentioned here that we're doing new criteria that have now come out 
and been published, and they are really much better because they allow um, identifying patients who have more skin-predominant disease without muscle disease. So again, hypomyopathic means that you might have some abnormalities on testing in terms of the lab or EMG or X-ray or MRI, but you're not going to be necessarily uh, symptomatic. And so people could have the skin disease, asymptomatic muscle disease, and be called hypomyopathic. And then there's all kinds of things to think about in terms of treatment, because some people with hypomyopathic don't really go on very to get more muscle disease. And so the treatments might be able to be a little bit modified if um, the muscle disease is not a problem. Clinically amyopathic is usually considered to be skin and, uh, and hypomyopathic and amyopathic. So these together, because it's mostly skin predominant in either category, are called clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis. So one study was done in Rochester uh, with using their epidemiology database, and over a very long period of time, they had 29 people who had dermatomyositis. And what they found was the incidence was about two per million uh, persons, and that the uh, rate of having skin predominant disease in that group was about 21%. However, during most of the time of the 29 patients were located between 1976 and 2007, we didn't have criteria that would have allowed identifying people. So I'm suspe I suspect that the rate of dermato may be higher than what is in the literature right now. In fact, when we were working on the criteria for Dermato, I was working very closely with an uh, international group of rheumatologists and neurologists, and they had a hard time understanding that there are so many people with skin predominant disease. And so we actually went back and looked at how many people presented to rheumatology with skin predominant disease over three years. It was three versus, as you can see here, many more with skin. And so, again, it depends on which population you're looking at as to the frequency of um, the diagnosis of skin predominant disease. And we really do think now that rheumatologists, because of the new criteria, are getting better at recognizing dermato. And I think we'll be seeing the fact that the uh, incidence is a little bit higher than we probably thought. And then also to show you that we have all this uh, criteria project called the International Myositis Classification Criteria was um, allowed really, uh, was none of these uh, different criteria work for identifying, again, skin predominant patients very well. The new criteria but allow that if you have two out of three of these, heliotrope, Gotrans papules, or Gotrans sign, we can say, okay, you likely have dermatomyositis, and that's particularly helped if you have, you know, other findings as well as a skin biopsy that goes along with that diagnosis. And this is just saying that more than almost 75% of people who have skin predominant disease now can be recognized by the new criteria that have actually just come out and been published. Okay, so lung disease. This is what the lungs can look like. Not all lungs look like this, but it can actually get to be pretty severe and people can be pretty short of breath. And the good news is uh, that it can be treatable for many people and it can be reversed. But if people have bad pulmonary function tests and a cough, dyspnea, certain patterns on the chest CT or, or don't respond to steroids, then we have to worry more about their lungs and, poten and potentially treat them a little bit differently. We know that quality of life is a big issue in uh, dermatomyositis, and in particular, uh, we, we think people who are often are affected in the emotional realm, also with muscle disease in the physical realm. Uh, it's, and we also know that compared to other medical conditions, such as myocardial infarction or high blood pressure or even type 2 diabetes, that the quality of life in dermatomyositis can be worse in many of the domains that can be measured. So the impact of the disease is really quite significant, and that's one of the reasons why we need to develop more therapies. And this is also emphasizing that in dermatomyositis, which is in this darker bar here, there's much more itch than what you can see, for instance, in a comparable lupus lesion. So itching is not in your head. It's a real problem and a real uh, finding in many people who have skin involvement. So then what do we do to work people up? So, you know, if somebody's much older and we're worried about that uh, increase in, in, in malignancy, we might do a bit of a screen, especially in dermatomyositis patients. 
but I think it's important to realize that it's it's like on the order of a fifth of people who are quite old who get this that are having problems with underlying malignancy. It's most people do not. And so you don't want to be worrying all the time about it, but you want to just do the kind of screening that you should be doing anyway, by and large, uh, to, to look for that. And so there's a big debate in the literature about how best to do that kind of a workup, but I'm not going to go through it, but just to summarize that you want to make sure, for instance, if you've been 50 or high, older, that you get your colonoscopy, that your women are getting their mammograms. You know, there's just very basic uh, things that everybody should be doing. And then often early on in the disease, we might be doing some scans and things like that. But it's hard to know what to recommend because there's not very good data to say what, what really makes a difference. And sometimes if we're worried in a high-risk group, we might be getting things like a chest CT or abdominal CT or uh, pelvic CT or ultrasound. And I think um, in particular in the first two to five years, we worry, uh, you know, I would say in the first you know, three to five years, uh, there's increased risk uh, that then eventually goes down to close to normal. And it's just good to be vigilant, bring new, new, new items of, of that are happening to you to your doctor's attention, but not to be overly worried about it because it's not that common. Now, we have a way to measure the skin, and we've, I have spent a lot of time with a group of people trying to validate this instrument. And it's a way of measuring skin activity and skin damage by looking at things like redness in the skin and scale and erosions. And so we've been able to show that this um, way of measuring the skin activity, so the higher the number, the worse the disease activity. And, uh, and over here, we're looking at that, remember that I told you about the interferon beta, which is a protein that um, is driving some of the inflammation in dermatomyositis. So what this is showing is that when you have moderate to severe skin disease, as measured by this uh, the thing I showed you, the, the, the instrument to measure skin activity, you get more interferon in the blood. And so it's a, it's a pretty good way of showing that this biomarker is correlating with skin activity. And what you can see here is that interferon alpha is actually not really correlating as much. So this is really seeming to be more of an interferon beta driven process. Another thing we've been able to show is that when somebody gets better with treatment, it doesn't matter which treatment, but some kind of treatment that makes them better in terms of their skin at least, we can show that their quality of life goes, gets better. The, the score goes from here down to here, and this is a very big change in quality of life, improvement in quality of life. So treating the skin makes people uh, really feel much better, but what we find is that when people don't get better in terms of they're a non-responder for treatment, um, the quality of life doesn't change, and so we really, it, this is another reason why we need to get better treatments so that we can have something to offer people who don't respond to our therapies at the current time. So how do we treat um, treatment, how do we treat dermatomyositis? And I can tell you, it really depends on each person and to a certain extent on which organs are involved, and there's no um, really, um, absolute answer to how to do this. It really is individualized. But if there's muscle or significant lung disease, then often one has to go on steroids for some period of time. And uh, if there's a bad interstitial lung disease uh, or muscles, you may have to go on immunosuppressive, uh, such as uh, either azathioprine or mycophenolate or um, uh, methotrexate, and these are commonly used for people who have either muscle or skin disease, um, and even in, I, you might only use uh, immunosuppressives for skin disease uh, without the steroids. It just depends on each person how severe their disease is. IVIG seems to work, but you still have to keep getting it. Very often when you stop, the disease comes back. Rituximab helps seemingly, may help um, some people with refractory muscle disease, but we're still waiting for more definitive studies. It's not so clear how well it works in the skin. And we need a lot more research to, and to get better treatments and to understand who should get which treatment. So I was telling you about lungs, and this is somebody who had lung disease. You can see the white areas here. There's this is areas of uh, inflammation and fibrosis. And this is before they got mycophenolate, mofetil, or Celsep, and after. You can see how much better, there's not so much white anymore in the lung fields, which are, are highlighting for you, and they've gotten much, much better. And so that's one of the reasons why we do try to screen for lung disease 
and see if it's if you have it, if it's getting worse, or if you don't have it, do you get it? Um, but this is to emphasize that it's uh, it can be quite treatable for some people. So for the skin. One of the things we recommend it, and is sunscreens, and usually using a pretty high SPF. 30 isn't usually enough for people like who have skin disease. You might want to actually go up to 70 or 100. We often also want to get a UVA blocker or get a physical blocker because um, the sunscreens can make a big difference. I put in here avoid immunostimulatory herbs or weight loss powders. Uh, some of these can actually exacerbate the disease or um, even trigger it. And so you want to be really careful about what you ingest. Um, and if you've been taken any of these at the time you got your dermato, you want to report that to your doctor as well. We often use topical steroids. Um, we use intralesional steroids sometimes. Uh, these are other non-steroidal topicals uh, that we sometimes use, Eladil or Protopic. Uh, Pemicrolimus is another name uh, for the, for the uh, Eladil. And uh, then uh, if somebody has pretty significant uh, disease that we think the topicals and sun avoidance aren't going to really help, then we might move on and talk about uh, use of hydroxychloroquine or antimalarials. And that can sometimes be beneficial. Things don't work, topicals and antimalarials, and then we have to go on to other things. We use steroids more like a bridge, um, but try not to use it for long term because it just has a lot of side effects. Thalidomide, is, there's really almost no literature about, but sometimes we'll use it. And IVIG, I told you, can be helpful, but again, it's costly and a little inconvenient, but it can be helpful. So the anti-CD20 is a way to get rid of B cells that are making some of the antibodies, and maybe that's how it's working. Um, and we don't have very good data yet um, in, in terms of controlled trials that it works, but you know there are some patients who haven't gotten better with other treatments, and when they get rituximab, they seem to do a little bit better, or other B cell depleters. And then cytokine inhibitors, again, we don't want to use anti-TNF. Um, there's been a lot of interest in uh, anti-interferons, and in particular, I'll point out anti-interferon beta might be one approach also to think about uh, for people that are, have problems with dermatomyositis. So um, the uh, Corvus, uh, who's helped uh, sponsor today, has also had a, had a, uh, a drug um, in development, and it's called, uh, uh, at this point, anabasum, lanabasum, and uh, the other name for abbreviation was AJA. And what this is showing you is that when we take um, blood cells from people who have dermatomyositis and then stimulate them in culture, we can actually, when we add back a low concentration of this medication, it blocks the production of cytokines that drive the immune response. And so what that means is blocking the TNF is a good thing. It prevents the cells from stimulating and causing problems, we think, potentially. And we found the same thing to be true Actually, with interferon alpha, you can see here at these concentrations of 10 micromolar, which is very low, and here, that it blocks interferon production from stimulated peripheral blood. And we found the same thing with interferon beta. So I want to show you some of the early results from our trial um, that uh, was NIH-funded, but also uh, very much supported by Corvus. And um, this was a placebo-controlled trial. It was randomized, and it was really the first trial uh, for skin-predominant dermato that was really done in this kind of controlled way. There were 22 patients enrolled, uh, and uh, for one month, people got half dose, and then for two months, they got the full dose, and then for one month, they were off the medication and were followed. And in terms of how they did, um, what this tells you is that there was a positive result for the trial after a very short trial and with, a, you know, again, only two months of the higher dose. Um, the p-value was considered significant and versus in the drug versus the placebo in terms of the skin outcome, meaning the skin got measurably better than the people with the people who got drug relative to placebo. And there were many other outcomes tracked in terms of quality of life and itch and so on that also seemed to improve. So I'll show you a little bit of that data. So this is who was in the trial. Again, 11 were, uh, got anabasum and uh, 11 got placebo. And you can see a, a lot were women in the trial. Uh, and um, in general, the BMI was around 25. And this is just showing you. So when people got the lower dose, there was really no difference between getting placebo and drug. But when the dose was doubled in the, in the drug, you can start to see 
that there was um, a big difference in the people who got the higher dose of drug on blue here relative to the ones who got placebo. And what we're measuring here is the skin activity. And so when the activity gets better, the score goes down. So these scores are lower, and you can see again at the end of the study that it was statistically significantly better than placebo. So if you actually look at the difference of um, the, the drug-treated group versus placebo, and this is a, a non-psychoactive cannabinoid that, as, as I showed you, has these, non these anti-inflammatory properties, um, what you can see is, again, very consistently and very rapidly after beginning to get the double dose, which is, was at, at four weeks, that the score really comes down in the treated group relative to the placebo group. And if you look at other things like the, uh, if um, we asked the patients to assess how they were doing in terms of their global disease using something called a VAS score, a visual analog scale, again, the scoring came down pretty quickly and stayed down during the study and it was statistically significant. Fatigue seemed to improve. And so um, I, that's very promising data. And based on that, um, there's now a, a larger study that's being in the planning phases that uh, will further investigate uh, success of this, for not just for skin, but also for other manifestations of dermatomyositis. But at the end, I want to emphasize that the skin is an important part of the disease, that there are some people who don't get mu uh, muscle um, we do check for other organs involvement, whether it be lungs or uh, underlying problems. And then we treat based on the organs that are involved and the response to the treatments that we have. And then we, if, patient, if people need steroids for the muscle, uh, we often will add in things like uh, mycophenolate or, or salicep, methotrexate, and azathioprine, as well as for skin. And we've talked about the fact that there are really a number of different treatments to try. So if you don't respond to one thing, you don't want to give up. You want to keep uh, pushing along to find the right treatment. And I do want to emphasize sort of as my final note that we have a lot of new exciting treatments in the pipeline. I think um, that this is a really um, important time uh, to, because I think we have opportunities to understand the disease better, but also to treat the disease better. And uh, so that I want to end and uh, be able to answer some questions. Wow, that's a lot of information, Dr. Worth. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I um, saw some activity in the chat going on. The, in, the improvement in fatigue seemed to spark some excitement. I know for me it does. Well, there first was a question about what an immune, immunostimulatory herb is. Is that like echinacea? Um, that was one of the responses. Yeah, so um, I mean, I, there are things like green algae, spirulina, um, maybe echinacea, um, and the, the other one is the question marks, the ones that haven't been studied that we don't know about. And so I think it's very, um, when you have a disease that's not well understood and it's very frustrating to have it and it's not getting better, there's a huge tendency to go for al alternative treatments. And so you just want to be careful to know what you're taking and to clear it with your doctors. Yeah, we see that in our support groups a lot. Um, people, you know, posting these types of fasting, water fasting diets, and you know, and we always try to jump in and say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, <laughs> slow down. Talk to your doctor first. Yeah, it's a, it's a. I mean, it's truly. A, you know, I always say if you're trying an alternative therapy, it's alternative because it hasn't been studied. Because when it's been studied, it's no longer alternative. It's going to be mainstream. Absolutely, good point, and thank you for clarifying that. Um, one question for me is, um, what is, what is your experience with pain in dermatomyositis as far as muscle pain? Yeah. Um, yeah, muscle pain is very real. And sometimes you can have muscle pain and not have anything objective. Like the muscle enzymes might be normal. Even the EMG or the MRI are normal, but people really can, there's something not right. And maybe it's the fascia overlying the muscle. It's not clear. Um, but pain is definitely a part of the muscle inflammation that can, that can happen in this disease. Can we quote you on that in our groups? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, because there has been so much controversy over pain. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Vera says um, she manages a group, for, a group for ADM, and there's some disagreement about treating document, about when to treat. Um, mm -hmm. Some skin symptoms okay, or does it mean you have a systemic disease that must be stopped? So I guess her question is basically, if you have ADM, 
and we received a version of this question earlier, do you continue treating that until the symptoms are con like gone all, all the way, or is there a point where you just kind of have to, I guess, be happy with what you have? Something yeah, I, you know, I think the way to think about it is the risk benefit ratio. And I think a lot of people with dermato don't get rid of their skin completely, but it gets down to a low enough level that it's not bothering them. And if it's not bothering them, then I don't think it's worth pursuing getting rid of the last little bit of pink or erythema. I think it's, um, it, it then becomes more risky than not. There's no evidence that treating to the last bit makes any difference in terms of systemic inflammation or decreasing side effects or anything like that. Okay, that's a good, good point, thank you. Um, let's see, we have Sarah Harrington. She is on her iPad and can't chat, but I can read to you. Um, is there a way to test for interferon levels? Mm. So, you know, it's still, we, we've wor worked a long time to even have a biomarker at all. Um, and you know, it's still in very early days and there's no such thing as really going out and getting interferon level that would be like commercially available or, or helpful. It turns out that interferon itself it, uh, is very transient. And so what people tend to do is they look at proteins that are upregulated by interference or they look at the, the mRNA and it's pretty complicated and probably not something that's going to make a difference in terms of, uh, of what's done. I think what you experience with the disease, whether it be, you know, skin or muscle is more important at this point than worrying about interferon levels. Okay. Um, as far as the muscle biopsies are concerned, you know, I guess some doctors say that they're the gold standard in a definitive diagnosis for those with muscle involvement. Um, is that maybe not so much true anymore with all these other diagnostic tests? Well, so the new criteria are allowing for making a diagnosis with or without a muscle biopsy. The variables are a little bit different. Uh, and I think that we recognize uh, the skin, I think, in a little bit more now. And so if somebody has the skin findings and a skin biopsy that looks like dermatomyositis and has really bad inflammation, uh, and an elevated CPK, and, and always, I think, either an e, uh, EMG or MRI to document that there's muscle inflammation. At that point, it seems unlikely that a muscle biopsy is going to really change the approach to treatment. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, Jessica, or yes, Jessica. Um, see, she, her doctor had her on prednisone 80 milligrams daily to improve muscles. Uh, because she could not walk. She was on dosage for five months straight. It caused her to go into ketoacidosis with the type 2 diabetes, still on prednisone with Cellcept. Is it possible that once she's off prednisone completely, the diabetes might go away? So I, I know this is a question. I have the same issue with steroid-induced diabetes, and a lot of people do. And I'll, I'll just give you what my endocrinologist told me, and then maybe you can clarify from your experience. She sure. told me that there's basically a 50% chance. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends a little bit on already. How, um, there are people who are sort of pre-diabetic or have tendencies towards diabetes and the steroids kind of unmask it. Um, and, you know, I, th I think that sometimes with the weight gain and everything else that goes on uh, with treatment, you know, it may tip them over into diabetes and it may not go away unless they lose weight and do the things that are needed. Um, I think that, uh, but in other people where there's none of that tendency, then maybe stopping the steroids eventually will, will help get rid of the disease. Okay. And again, it's part of that risk benefit, as you mentioned, continuing on the prednisone if it's worth, um, you know, the risks and stuff that are involved in. Well, better. right, exactly. And if you can't walk, that's pretty risky. Yes. And my comments before about the muscle biopsy were really only, again, related to people who also had skin. And polymyositis, there's a differential, and you kind of are stuck with getting, uh, I think, a muscle biopsy. Sure. Thanks for that clarification. I uh, didn't even think to mention that. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Is there a proven connection between myositis and colitis at all? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so who's asking that question? <laughs> uh, Marjorie Bronstein. Okay. So there's really very little written about this. Uh, we actually are just submitting an abstract to a meeting coming up in May, the International Investigative Derm Meeting. 
Um, and I'm pretty convinced that there is a microscopic colitis that we see in people with dermatomyositis. Not in everybody, but it, it definitely happens, and it's at an increased amount relative to other people who don't have dermato. So that's not like medication induced, it's an actual um, something that's there as part of the disease process, potentially. Uh, that's my belief um, because I've seen so many people that have it <laughs> and have okay. dermato. Um, but I can't, you know, and then it, the only way you would know for sure is if they actually had, you know, endoscopy and had a biopsy and when they do, or colonoscopy, but they, when they do, they have microscopic colitis and, uh, you know, and that, that I, I've had, you know, quite a number of people with matter that have had that. Wow. That's interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, Karen Cheng. Um, Dr. Worth, are you involved in the research of recombinant FC IVIG, which is said to be a lot more potent than regular IVIG? And do you see that as a future novel treatment? So I think what the, they're referring to is an antibody that blocks the FC, uh, FCN receptor. Um, <clears throat> and that one is being tested, for instance, in autoimmune blistering disease and for some blood uh, hematologic problems. Um, it's not yet being tested that I know of in dermatomyositis, and um, I think it's way too early to know what its role might be. Okay. Um, let's see, Bob, in the anabasum, now lenabasum study, did the patients continue their other drugs, and was muscle strength measured, or was it just skin? So the background medication was kept the same, and with this, the uh, lenabasum was an add-on medication. Um, and we did do MMT testing and do um, uh, scores to evaluate extra muscular as well as um, muscle disease. Wow, great. Was there um, any noticeable strength increase? So the, the people that were enrolled in this study um, oh, pretty much were selected for having skin disease because skin was the primary outcome. Um, and some of them had muscle disease before that had been treated and had gotten better. But it, I think we can't say too much right now about how it works for the muscle. Okay. Um, the, the heart disease that has been talked about a lot lately um, with the arrhythmias and, and so forth, um, is there anything out there that is, is helpful for that that you know of? So, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, I think um, the inflammation that can happen in the joints or in the lungs can happen in, in the heart. And, you know, I think anything that can dampen the inflammation is, is possibly going to help. But I think we don't actually have formal studies that have looked at before and after treatment. Um, my suspicion is that any systemic medication that dampens uh, inflammation may help to some extent, with some of the heart problems. I don't know if it's specifically about the arrhythmias, but at least with some of the heart problems. Hi, Jerry. This is Sarah. I have um, another question, please. Sure. Is um, the hydrochloroquine or the Plaquenil, is that mostly for the skin, or could that also help muscles? That's a great question. Um, I think it mostly is going to help skin. There's really no evidence that it helps muscle at all. And actually, occasionally... And very rarely it can actually cause a myopathy, which, um, you know, in, in individual people who've been on it for a very long time uh, and don't have any uh, evidence of, on, you know, ongoing otherwise dermatomyositis, it may be actually important to recognize it could be from the medication. But, it, no, it's mainly for the skin. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, lupus as a overlapping uh, syndrome or with uh, dermatomyositis. Uh, do you feel that that's being maybe overdiagnosed or maybe there's just not enough to differentiate to kind of like what you said during your presentation? So I think they're individual. I, I'm very sure that they're individual people that have even in the skin, skin lupus and skin dermato and I've seen it and sometimes people will start out with one and, and switch to the other and then back even. Um, and then there are people in you know so another, or they may have it at the same time. So, I, and then I think the idea of having overlaps between dermato and SLE, yeah, definitely it can happen. Um, you know, where you have antibodies that you would see predominantly in SLE, such as a double strand of DNA and, you know, having renal disease, but also having features of dermatomyositis. And, and, and so, um, you know, there's a whole variety, I think, of patients. But I, I think more frequently what happens is people get diagnosed with lupus when they, in fact, have dermatomyositis. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Um, LDN, low dose naloxone. Do you have any any thoughts on on using that to treat dermatomyositis? So it's certainly being used in uh, sort of I would say off label for many different autoimmune type things. I don't think we have really hard and fast data right now. I mean, it would be interesting to do a study to be able to answer that question. I don't think I can answer it right this minute. Okay, definitely respect that. Um, are you aware of a link between parvovirus and dermatomyositis? Yeah, that's a great question. What are the infectious triggers? Um, I mean, parvo can be a mimicker for lupus. <clears throat> and I think that different infections can possibly trigger, you know, autoimmune processes. So I don't think it's the most common of the triggers, but it, I'm sure it can happen. Okay. Uh, and then we have a question as far as, um, I'm not sure if this is, well, I'll ask it anyway. Um, side effects to methotrexate versus Celsept, and when to stop Celsept? So, I mean, methotrexate, if you drink alcohol, you probably shouldn't, shouldn't be taking methotrexate. So that's one of the differentiators. Um, if somebody has lung disease, I might opt from uh, Celsept over methotrexate. Um, I think they both can work really well. I think methotrexate or azathioprine might work better for joints, um, and so that's something to keep in mind, and it really gets to what the predominant uh, um, manifestation is of, of the dermatomyositis. And when to stop, I mean, I think it's, uh, it depends on how, if somebody's getting better and, you know, they're off other medication, medications like steroids uh, and stable, then you, I would say you can slowly reduce sometimes immunosuppressives, but it really has to be individualized and usually a pretty slow taper. Okay. So this was uh, one question that we've been emailed a couple times uh, a few days ago was uh, a patient wants to stop IVIG, um, just example criteria. He's been stable on IVIG uh, for two years, um, but he's having, like you mentioned earlier, he's having to continue to get it in order to get the benefit. Is there a safe way to try and, I guess, test to see if you don't need it by just stopping it? Or would that be something that should be lowered slowly? I think a little bit that depends on why a person's getting IBIG. Um, and sometimes what we do is we lengthen the interval uh, between dosing as opposed to just stopping it. Um, and, you know, maybe go from every four weeks to every five weeks to every six and gradually lengthen it out. And if you get to, you know, every four months or so, well, then maybe you can really just stop. But, you know, I think in particular, if somebody had bad muscle disease and that's what's been controlling things, you might not want to just stop it and wait for things to, you know, you may want to more slowly bring it down. Sure. Is estrogen dominance a factor in dermatomyositis in women, especially those in perimenopause? Yeah, I mean, I think that individual people, hormones are a clear driver. I mean, when you look at, for instance, the patients with skin predominant disease, it's largely women. So I, it's hard for me to believe that there's not some hormonal component. Um, although often, and the perimenopause is interesting. I don't think we know all that much about it, um, you know, to tell you the truth, but I think there's clearly going to end up being some, some hormonal issues there. And there are people who also once a month, you know, have flares of their disease. So that would also suggest, you know, some hormonal input. Okay. Uh, do, uh, do you ever test for hormones, hormone levels, or as part of a workup, or just maybe depends upon symptoms? Yeah, I don't normally, I don't know what I would do with that information exactly. But I would say one of the things I worry a little bit about is people who, um, are going through IVF and having huge surges of hormones in that process when they have dermato, I think that, you know, you have to really work carefully with your doctor to make sure that that's safe. All right. And I'm going to ask you a question about my case, and I know we don't want to get too personal, and that's, that's all great. Um, but have you seen my uh, polymyositis patients that have, like, a separate, and I'm sure you have, I guess, but that have been diagnosed with, I guess, um, skin lupus. Like my, my skin biopsies show discoid lupus, but a lot of the skin symptoms seem to look like dermatomyositis, but my muscle biopsy shows clear polymyositis. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a huge debate right now, even among neurologists, about what the histology is and defining histology. 
Um, but if your skin manifests, you know, first off, the dermato and lupus under the microscope from the skin, they look really identical. So, so you can't really differentiate. So if your skin findings look a little bit like dermato um, and you have muscle disease, I would kind of uh, think about whether this, you actually have dermatomyositis, not polymyositis. But again, it would really, really require looking at carefully at the skin findings. Sure. Yeah, there is a lot going on right now, with, especially with dermatomyositis. And yeah, it's a great time. Yes, it is. Um, it's wonderful for those with DM. I'm beyond thrilled. So um, I want to sincerely thank you um, on personally and as uh, a, you know, the president and founder of Myositis Support and Understanding. What, what great information. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to add before we let you get on with your busy day? Well, the one thing I would say is that if you have Dermato and you're frustrated and you potentially want to help uh, with developing new treatments, um, to keep an eye on trial.gov, which talks about new, new trials that are coming along and the sites that are doing them, and that will help, you know, because we really do need, uh, it's very, very important for people with Dermato and Poly uh, to contribute to getting our, our better therapies. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And that's something that, that we're doing at MSU is we try to we try to find those clinical trials and help help recruit uh, from our membership. So you guys heard it. They need patients. Rare disease patients are hard to find. So keep an eye out. We want to thank Dr. Worth for being with us today, Rare Disease Day 2018, for this educational session about dermatomyositis. We appreciate your valuable time, Dr. Worth. We also want to thank Corbis Pharmaceuticals. Uh, thank you, Ted and Lindsay, for joining the session today. And please visit Myositis Support and Understanding online at understandingmyositis.org. Thank you.